Welcome back to the Prepared Mindset Podcast. I am your host, Austin, and we have a very special guest joining us this week. But as always, before I go ahead and get into that, I want to make sure I say a big thank you to our sponsors. First up, EclipseHolsters.com. Guys, head over to Eclipse Holsters. Check them out. If you're looking for a new holster, maybe a new mag carrier, a dump tray, uh, EDC belt, maybe just some really, really cool stickers, head over to Eclipse, use our code PREPARED15, save you 15% off. If you guys spend over 60 bucks, they're going to hook you up with free shipping, and they guarantee that they're going to have your order out the door in the mail on its way to you so you can start carrying in three business days or less. Can't beat that right now. Hell, even Amazon's taking three, four days for delivery. Uh, you can't beat out the door on a custom-built holster in under three days. We got all the colors, all the designs, whatever hardware you guys need, uh, whatever you're looking for. If you don't see it on the site, uh, shoot Justin or team a message. Ask them about it. Nine and a half times out of ten, they can hook you up. They can get it taken care of. They, they have some great partners. They can do custom Kydex prints. They can get whatever you need. EclipseHolsters.com and also MyMedic.com. Whatever you guys need for your first aid uh, kit, whether you're putting together something for a camping trip, you need a little ouch pouch for the uh, kids' uh, t-ball league that's getting ready to gear up, uh, soccer starting, I mean, vacations, uh, I mean, all kinds of things. Maybe you just need to have something in your vehicle so that when something inevitably does go wrong, you're covered. MyMedic. Check out their MyFAC. Guys, I can... I can honestly say that the MyFAC, MyFAC Advanced is is tops. It's got everything I could ever think to need in a kit and more. Uh, I, I picked one of those up from them, and it, it's been awesome. They hooked us up with our code MINDSET20. MINDSET20. It'll save you 20% off on the website. And if you guys want to head over to our Facebook page and our offers section, use our link. We'll actually get a small... 10% piece of whatever you spend will come back to the prepared mindset so we can keep doing more content for you guys and putting out new material. You can still even partner it with the mindset 20 discount code. So using our affiliate link doesn't actually disqualify you from saving some money on a tourniquet or a burn kit, or maybe just a very basic, uh, you know, one of their solo, uh, you know, first aid kits, more of their MyFax, uh, or the MyFax Large, if you're buying it for, like I was saying earlier, you know, some uh, some rec league sports, something on the much larger scale to take care of a group of people, not just yourself. MyMedic.com. Guys, this week I have Tim uh, joining me. Tim is better known as Concept Gray on Instagram. He has a wealth of uh, firearms knowledge. He's going to be joining me. We're going to be talking about I mean, honestly, a whole slew of different things. Uh, we did run into some technical issues on this recording, uh, just as a heads up before we jump in. So there might be some moments where we got to splice some things together. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and jump into that. Tim from Concept Gray. Hey, Tim. Thanks for coming online, man. I really appreciate it. Sure thing. I appreciate you having me. Uh, be good talk to talking stuff. No, absolutely. Um, you know, we had... Uh, the concealed journey on a couple of weeks back. Um, and I actually was able to catch a good portion of the, the IG live you guys did. Um, oh, how was it? It was good. I thought it was good, man. Um, I always enjoy when we can get people together to, you know, just talk a little shop. Um, but you know, share some knowledge and really, uh, just bring people in the community together. I think that, um, you know, we got a lot of stuff, good, got a lot of good things going on with like, you know, YouTube and things, but actually being able to get discussion going between, um, between parties, I think is where like you really start to get into some of the good discussion and people can actually learn from each other rather than just watching the same, like, and, and no hate on some of the bigger guys out there. Right. But the same, like 16 YouTube channels and, uh, you hear some of the same things over and over again. Like, yeah, I know surefire is great, but is there something else out there? You know, yeah, that kind of thing. Agree, but, um, uh, before we jump in, you know, too far, uh, tell us about yourself. How did, how did you get where, where you're at now as concept gray on Instagram? All right. Um, so let's see. Um, I got into guns when I was 21, kind of late in comparison to a lot of other folks. Um, I moved to, to Florida from Massachusetts and not a very gun friendly state. I moved when I was like 17, I think I was. And my parents are gun people. My dad's not a gun guy. So it was, um, definitely a Florida thing. You know, everyone calls Florida the gun shine yeah. today. So I got into guns 
uh, was never a big social media person for a while. I, like I rebuked Facebook for a long time until you know some people were like, yeah, I got Facebook. My I got Facebook. Um, and then the Instagram thing started. Um, I had like a personal one. I'm like, hey, you know what? I've got you know decent collection of guns. Let me just do some gun stuff. And the name Concept Gray kind of started off with that whole like gray man mentality, but it's very much gone away from there now. I mean, like if you're posting your guns on social media, it's not very gray man. So um, I just kept the name because it had a good ring to it, and, and I liked it. Um, as far as photography and all that stuff, I took a little bit of photography in college, more of like I enjoyed doing it. So I yeah. learned some of the basics, you know, black and white photo, you know, darkroom stuff. And I've applied those principles into, you know, Instagram stuff. But um, like for now, what my Instagram is, is, is just, just a peek into the gun world from not a super influencer or, you know, you know, trying to shill products or like that. It's just what I like. It's a mix of real stuff and then just some fun stuff. Yeah. No, I mean, and honestly, I, I really enjoy what, what you're, you know, your content and what you post. Um, you got a couple of, uh, <laughs> a couple of Mark 12s. And then there was that, yeah. um, like you just got, you picked up, I think a, it was a 1911 or it was, it was something, there was something special about it. I remember you guys were talking yeah. about it during the IG live with, uh, with concealed journey, uh, through, I, and, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about this because I didn't, I had no idea this like government program existed. I, I think it's a government program or like a government partner program or something to allow, uh, to allow citizens to get firearms. Um, and I know you mentioned you were picking one up and I was like, that's awesome. Like even just, I mean, just from like a, the cool factor alone, but I mean, I love 1911. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's the CMP program. Um, it's something that I discovered years and years ago. Um, I forgot how I found it. I, I, it's it's out there. You know, if you're a gun guy, it, it could be out there. And the the program goes back to roughly 1903. Uh, Roosevelt saw those deficiency and you know citizens. He noticed a deficiency in, in servicemen in their shooting um, because they didn't shoot as private citizens. So they started the CMP program, which is the Civilian Marks, Marksmanship Program, which gave access to surplus firearms. Um, to civilians so they could buy from the government. And the 1903 was really the one that kicked it off and happened to be in 1903 when the program started. So uh, you can get 1903s, you can get M1s are really tough. Uh, M1 carbines are really tough. M1 Garands. And they've never done handguns before. And like, I was able to pick up <laughs> and you this got one. one. <clears throat> yeah, I did. And it was, it was a heck of a process. It was like an eight page. It was a little bit different um, because with the M1 Garands, you can actually have shipped to your house. Um, the but hand doesn't gun, require like an like. I mean, do you still you go to like, the background to to check? FFL. Um, you submit information and they run a check there, but they're okay. able to mail it to your house. So when I got my M1 Garand, I actually drove to Anniston, Alabama, to go handpick mine. That's um, awesome. On That's July, so awesome. 10th, like fourth, yeah, Fourth uh, of July happened, and I was with my pretty recent my my girlfriend. Now we were together pretty recently, and I was like, hey, listen tomorrow I'm hopping in the car and I want to go to Alabama <laughs> to go handpick this rifle. Do you want to come with me? And she did. And, you know, uh, we didn't get to go to Aniston because Aniston's where the big facility is, uh, mm-hmm. where they process them and all that stuff. Um, they actually built, if you forget some time, check it out. The Talladega Marksmanship Park It's it's funded by CMP dollars and all that kind of stuff. And it is a resort of sorts, like a, like a very nice shooting lodge per se. It's a very, I mean, they've got their 600 yard range out there, five or 600. I think it's either five or six. I don't remember, but when they do competitions and all that kind of stuff, and they have smaller, uh, smaller ranges for you know hundred yard pistol and up to rifle and all that kind of stuff. Um, they have the most advanced outdoor sh- targeting system, which you know, you to, it's at the, yeah, it's at the different ranges and the target comes up and it's like this paper esque material that's a self healing membrane and it uses uh, triangulation. So when the bullet impacts the target it shows up on a screen next to you wow that's yeah really cool stuff so any like real gun guy needs to uh make a, a pilgrimage to to cmp talladega i was gonna say that is i gotta put that on the list man like that's yeah it, that's next level <laughs> um there is a cmp in ohio as well that's cmp north um there's no i don't my understanding there's not a range there but there's another facility that does the processing of the rifles as well because um What's happened now with the program is, you know, during the Cold War and all that kind of stuff, we sent out God knows how many M1 Garands to anybody that wanted to fight communism. 
So the Philippines sure. got a lot. Um, a lot of a lot of Southeast Asia got a lot of it. You know, think of Korea and all that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. we gave them gave them the rifles for free, and it was a loan lease program essentially. And the only contingent was we had the first right of refusal when they decided to get rid of these rifles. Um, so that's what a lot of the rifles that are coming back now. They're not World War II era. Um, they're, you know, like we'll, we'll call Korea. Vietnam. Yeah, Korea and, and so forth. Um, and it, it's really cool. There's, there's costs associated with this, like CMT. Uh, when they had a big batch of rifles come from the Philippines, they were untouched. They were in these cases. They were in a warehouse that was leaking. So there's a lot of rust. And then uh, I was reading an article about it. There's this termite that got into it. So oh, they God. had it destroyed all the, the stock. So they had to get rid of all the stock, fumigate the rifles, pack them in a container ship and ship them over. And there's like millions of dollars of cost that goes into this. Um, funny enough, the... It's not to get too political, but the Obama administration put a stop to it. That doesn't and, surprise me. Yeah. And kind of <clears throat> the supply dried up, and then the Trump administration opened it up right away. And, and you can find the information on that. And you know, more rifles have been, have been coming in. Um, the 1911 program, I'm, I don't know what the nuances of it, but it's the first time I've ever done pistols. Um, and they're all surplus U.S. Army pistols. I think it's U.S. Army because mine's an Army gun, but it could be it could be across the different services. I'm not a hundred percent sure uh, on that, but um, they have all these surplus pistols that have been sitting in boxes and they've allowed them to the public for the first time. And this process is really interesting. You had to fill out this packet because it was a handgun. So you did have to go to an FFL for this. Um, I had to get paperwork notarized, you know, that I was the first time. Yeah. So it was like, every bit of like eight pages of paperwork that you had to fill out, you had to provide your FFL info, you had to provide two forms of ID, a driver's license and something else, like a passport or something like that. Um, and with the, I'm going to backtrack a little with the rifles too. Um, you have to be a member of a CMP affiliate. So the easy way to do it okay. is just because of the grand uh, owners association. It's like 25 bucks for the year. You get a card to number and you have the access to CMP now. Um, same thing with the pistols. You had to be a, with an affiliate member at M1 Garand, the M1 Garand ownership group <laughs> fell into that category. So you had to provide them with your membership, and then you sent the packet off. Um, you, yeah. you, you couldn't set the packet off before January 4th or something like that, and well, no so after, like, a, like so there's there's a, like a window. window for it, yeah. And that wasn't even to get the, the pistols. That was to just get a lottery number. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. You, yeah, they got your packet, and then they issued you a lottery number. And then if your lottery number got pulled, you got a chance to uh, to pick a pistol. And um, they're supposed to have three grades. It was uh, like a service, a field, and a rack grade. Um, and, you know, rack being the worst and service mm-hmm. being the best. Um, when I got my call, all they had was rack and, and field. And I had read that the rack and field grades were, were people were getting really good shape. So I went with the field. So I went with the middle tier and I'm, I'm super happy with it because mine's Colt slide and Colt frame. So sometimes it can be mismatched. They could be Remington Rand slides and. Oh, okay. James yeah. And, I mean, you know, what went to the armory? Yeah, I mean, basically whatever they had, especially if it was you're like you're saying, it was sitting in storage for however many years and everything, you kind of just go with what you got. And mm-hmm. I mean, personally, I think that <clears throat> I think every American should own a 1911. I feel like it's it is to America what the AK is to Russia. You know, like it's our nation's firearm. I feel like it's just it's so right to have one. Like I, I own one. I love it. I love everything about it. I don't shoot it a ton because it's heavy as shit, and I just. You know, I, I, you know, I like my Glocks, but, um, Me too. no, I mean, I think that, uh, honestly, I wish we had more of that today. You know, it really sucks. Um, the political climate and everything, like it, it's cool to look back and cause I had no idea that program existed, you know? So to see that a president saw that in our country and was like, and, and what, like a hundred years ago ish, you know, give or take a little bit was like, Hey, this is something that's important. We should make this accessible to citizens so that they can they can train and be, you know, like proactive and and competent and safe members of society and stuff. Um, 
That's really aw- Have you shot it yet? Or is that one of those things you just, you're going to leave it in the safe? I'm going to shoot it. I haven't shot it yet. Um, I will shoot it a few times. I'm not going to completely safe clean it, but for the most part, it's, it's going to be an artifact. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I wanted it to match, you know, I wanted the 1911 to go with my M1 Grand. You know, <laughs> sure. Very, and the, the cool thing is, this is a 1943. So I don't know if I went to combat. It may or may not have, but as far as date wise, it does line up. Um, but who knows? Um, my M1 Grand is not war era. It was post-war, and even that story of why I went with what I went with is kind of cool, and it, it kind of goes to like the Americana ness of things. Um, my M1 Grand is, is an I, I sorry my word today, an IHC. So IHC is International Harvester Company. So okay. they retooled to make rifles. Oh, all right, yeah. So just like a Singer sewing machine, Singer sewing machine made 1911s. There's, I remember, yeah, I remember you guys talked about that on the Instagram live, and yeah. then the first thing I did was go Google that, and those things are you not cheap. Yeah, yeah. It, that is like I mean, insane. Only like yeah, there's only 500 ever made. I want a Union Switch and Signal. That's the second uh, most rare 1911, and I had mm-hmm. the opportunity a few years ago, and they were a few thousand dollars. Then, uh, when I was in the industry, I was working at a gun shop, and they had one. I really wanted it, but I'm like, at the time, I couldn't swing like three or four grand for you know a 1911. Yeah. Um, I mean, this was like six, six or seven years ago. Um, and now they've just gone up tremendously in value, but the same thing, union switch and signal. No, they, they're defunct now, but you know, they made railroad switches and signals, which I think is pretty cool. And then it kind of co-op is like the, the whole Americana of war effort, war bonds. You yeah. Know. I was just going to say that adds to like the cool fact. I mean, not, not to like rip on anybody who has like a war era Colt, right. Cause those are still legit um, or a Remington, but there is something like this, just that much cooler about like, Hey, I have, you know, one of these, you know, switching signals or like a singer or <clears throat> I know like I, there were some, um, I think machine guns that were made during the war by general motors and stuff like in yeah. a, in a small uh, number. And it's like, that's just one of those things. Like, if you have it, it just it makes it that much cooler. I think the Liberators were made by General Motors too. I'm not don't quote me at 100 percent on that, but have you ever seen a Liberator? It's a little pocket pistol they used to airdrop into yeah. France, right? For uh, 100 percent for resistance. 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't, I've actually I'd, been able to hold one. Is it as tiny um, as it looks in the books? Yeah, man. It's 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 small. I mean, it's about the size of like a Glock 42. Um, and it's like oh. stamped, rolled metal. It has like a chintzy magazine just to hold a few rounds in it and you know <laughs> yeah you pop it in the barrel it's it's really cool um it was a cut when i was in the gun shop it was a customer of mine a uh, really cool guy he was a former u.s diplomat and wow. yeah really cool guy he's in i never knew where he stood politically but he worked under reagan um he worked under reagan um carter bush bush and clinton Wow. Yeah, really, yes. really cool guy. He's got crazy stories. Um, I'm sure he, going through all that, yeah. He amassed a huge collection. Well, he it started off, you know, he had sold some land. He's like, well, let me sink some money to NFA items. And he started, <laughs> yeah, he started building a collection of iconic submachine guns. And it was like MP5s. He had a couple MP5s. Um, he had a 1951 British... Um, Obviously, it was America, but we gave it to the Brits, uh, Thompson. He had a 1928 Thompson, um, Augs. I mean, it, once he had all his like submachine guns, then he started mm-hmm. branching off into other things. But he had, sure. you name it, as far as a submachine gun, he had it. Um, the only thing I think he didn't have was an MP40, but he did have that General Motors machine gun, like grease gun type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, he had one of those. He bought the Liberator. And he brought that. We didn't shoot that, and, and that thing had a very short lifespan. Um, they, those but, looked cheap too. Just when we were talking about the Liberators being like stamped, almost like pot metal. Like those grease yeah. guns looked very more like a. It was a qu- uh, quantity over quality when it came to production on those. And I mean, that's pretty much how we won the war in general. Yeah. No. I mean, hey. I mean, manufacturing power and and just Absolutely. you know work with what you got in such a short amount of time. But again, that's what makes it cool, and you can get a hold of one of those things that's still intact, right? Is that like, oh. hey, this thing was not exactly built to last, and I got one, you know, here we are 80 years later, and <clears throat> it's still, you know, hanging around. So, yeah, it was pretty cool. 
so was working at that at that gun shop is that really when you kind of like got into all and really like started to immerse yourself in it, or did that come from something else um the, the gun shop i was always into guns um and i already had a decent collection um uh, but yeah that really took off that's where like the instagram kind of started taking off so, you know what i honestly i wish i had started taking more photos back then uh, of it um you know obviously my my style has changed a lot and from early on to to where i am now but yeah the the i really got to learn a lot you know want to humble yourself really quickly is think you know stuff and you go work at a gun shop and then people hit you with the most random questions and you're like i have no idea you know and they start asking for super obscure stuff and you're like man i really gotta like butch up on my knowledge yeah no i uh I tr- okay, so I, I tried when we first hit lockdown like a year and three months ago, whatever, but like March or April, I was like, you know, I got some extra parts laying around. This should be easy. I'm going to build and like it should be easy. An AR-15 upper receiver like <clears throat> should be stupid easy, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anytime the grinding wheel has to come out to fix something Ooh. that uh, didn't quite go right, um, you know that it you messed up somebody messed up somewhere along the line i think it was uh i got the i got it all put together and stuff um and i was installing the barrel <clears throat> and i the barrel had come off an old upper uh i had like the the pinned a frame sight on it you know and i uh, i was like all right cool you know put in the the gas the the gas tube and I was putting the gas block back on <laughs> and i'm like going to hammer in uh the pins to to pin it and they just didn't want to go. I'm like, all right, I you know checked like seven times. Hey, are these facing the right way? Everything good with this? Um, long story short, I ended up snapping one off halfway. Um, oh. And I got the other. I got the other, the first one in almost all the way. And then they snapped. I snapped the second one off. And I was like, well, this is effed. So I was like, I could leave it this way, but I'm not going to. So I took the grinding wheel to it and cut off the the front sight and got a free float. Uh, free flow gas Dark. blocking through, yeah. And I'm like, you know, man, never again. <laughs> this is why it's worth it to, to pay the money to your local gunsmith, man. It is not nearly as easy as it looks. And uh, I can only imagine with what you must have seen <clears throat> coming into a place like that, like the questions, especially because not everything used to be built to the same standards. Right now, it seems yeah. like everything's on your AR platform or some close variation therein. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, or same way like striker fired pistols, your mechanics are vaguely similar to basically yeah. if you can understand a glock you can understand most of what else, you know what else is out there um mm-hmm. yeah but if you jump back what like 80s 90s and and when everything was all still hammer fired and a lot of those guys still love that stuff right mm-hmm. the uh what is it, like the smith and wessons or even like the brownings and stuff um yeah. that were popular right. um like I, I looked up what was in uh if you remember the old show of miami vice i, I looked yep. up what what uh, Don Johnson carried, and apparently it was supposed to be a 10 millimeter, and they like effed around with it and made it a 45 or something goofy, and all this stuff. And that's all the kinds of things that I, I imagine as a gunsmith, like uh, when you encounter those kinds of problems, you're like, um, I mean, I'm sure there's a way to do it, so let's just figure it out, yeah. right? You know, I mean, um, it's the stuff the hell out of that works, you're right. I mean, it, it, it makes for cool stories and really cool experiences, and it helps when you have a shop with like the right tools. Um, no, we didn't have, first. our shop didn't have like the best gun. It had very limited gunsmithing abilities. Um, you know, there was no lathe. There was no, no, uh, I mean, there's a drill press, but no lathe and no mill and that kind of stuff. So it was, it was gunsmithing light. I'll call it. We had a full board gunsmith that worked there, um, that had gone to mm-hmm. gunsmith school and built his own guns and all that kind of stuff. But, um, uh, the shop that I worked at, um, it was, a, it was a local chain in Florida. They've got eight stores. So they've really minimized to keep a standard at every store of what they can do for the most part. Uh, I think they may do some seracoding now or something like that, but um, getting a gunsmith is actually a lot harder than you think. You know, having someone that's actually gone to school for gunsmithing, they're few and far between. And I wish that more places had access. Like, there was a there's a local store here, and what's what really, <clears throat> I will say, is responsible for kicking off my, like, my interest and passion for this is a local gun shop and the owner and one other guy, <clears throat> excuse me, were were gunsmiths. Like had gone to school for it and understood, you know, a, I mean, not everything. Obviously, they weren't like, you know, super high level, but they could do most things. Um, so 
this shop, if they didn't have it, they could order it, obviously. And then if you ordered a part through them, they would install it for free or they would teach you how to install it and stuff, um, which I thought was awesome. You know, my wife actually went and built um, her AR through that store uh, and oh, they had her cool. do all of it. And I was like, yeah, it's awesome, man. Like she actually has a nicer at the time, had a nicer AR than I did. And oh, she wow. had never shot one. I was like, man, man this is some, you know, this is some shit. I got to go spend some money now and make sure that this isn't a, you know, this isn't a thing. But um, they ended up, unfortunately, just not being able to keep up with uh, competition with like big box stores and everything. They made it uh, three or four years, I want to say, and then had to just close up shop, and it sucked because it was like three minutes from the house. I had like first name basis with those people. It was awesome, you know. Those are the kinds of places I think uh, make the the community better, you know, teaching. uh, And it comes at the expense of a little bit of a business, right? Um, If you're not coming in and paying for their however minor gunsmithing uh, services, but it, it helps the community. I think that that's, you know, something that's sorely missed. And uh, to your point, yeah, fewer and fewer people know how to do their own work on their firearms. And it's, I mean, at least basic maintenance, you should know how. I I mean, I can't tell you how many friends I have that went out and bought a gun last year during lockdown. They're like, um, yeah, you know, I bought this gun. I'm like, oh, cool. What is it? Oh, I have no idea. I'm like, what? <laughs> so what are you going to do? Like, well, I mean, if somebody comes in the house, I'll just shoot them. Like, all right, we're not going to have this discussion. I... You're going to make my head hurt, you know, <clears throat> but so, um, so you're pretty knowledgeable on a lot of this stuff. So one of the things I really wanted to get into with somebody who knows, right. Um, cause I love the, like the Mark 12 platform. <laughs> and I think that if you look at a lot of what we're seeing in, um, I guess popular shooting right now is the whole like recce concept, right? Everyone, uh, I feel like it started at the Mark 12, um, when they pioneered that with the war on terror, really looking at a five, five, six gun to distance. Um, and then we just, you know, it kind of just took off over the last maybe 15, 20 years. And now with looking at things like competition shooting, um, and the, just like the developments in optics and technology, and it's so much cheaper to have that kind of a platform, you know, I think that, uh, it makes sense, right. For most mm-hmm. American citizens, or I, I shouldn't say that anybody who's looking to be well prepared and well rounded, I would say that a Mark 12 esque or like recce style rifle, 16 inch barrel, um, maybe like a one to six optic or something there, and you know maybe a three to nine if that's what you have uh, in you know five five six two two three um, makes if you can only afford one rifle, you know that could be the best option for you. Um, you know, so how did, how did you end up with your Mark 12, if I can ask? So Mark 12 started when I worked at the gun shop, um, I had a manager, I was just a regular employee at the time then we became co-managers, um, that had one built, um, by a pretty known guy that was building Mark 12 and he built a, uh, mod zero and I shopped that and fell in love with it. And I was like, I was hooked. I'm like, I need to have a Mark 12. And from that point on, I was like, okay, I want to build the Mark 12 Mod 1. And it was right before Lone Survivor came out, and they really blew up. Um, so I started putting that rifle together, and I had everything together except for the rail. You know, I, I used a Colt 6920 upper and lower. I sourced a barrel. I sourced um, the right gas block, and it was trying to be pretty clone correct to it. And then I ran into the issue of the rail. You know, they just – they were – really hard to find if you did find it there were hundreds of dollars of over what you know msrp was so i waited and waited and rumor had it that you know night government was going to release the rast rail again and i just kept waiting and waiting and then two years later i was on all the you know any company that that had it available for uh email notification i was on and (laughs) i um yeah, I was just waiting, waiting, waiting. And then I was actually, my buddy was getting married and he asked me to be his best man. And we were at a, our favorite, one of our favorite places. And it was like 1 a.m. And I get an email notification from Operation Parts. And it's like, they it had like five of them available in stock. And I was like, oh, I was like super excited. I was like, what are you excited about? I'm like, oh, this ram is actually, <laughs> and my best friend LD is like this. He, he literally snatched the phone from my hand created an account and bought it for me for my uh groomsman gift wow so, dude that's yeah that's next level groomsman gift 
Yeah, man. Like, you know, and it's funny because I was his best man. And, like, all the grooves and got, um, they got Mont Blanc pens. And then here I am. I've got this finished rifle. I was like, man, I'll, I'll take this. I'll take, even though I like the Mont Blanc pen, like, I'll take a rifle, you know, a rifle component any day. So I built that one. That's got the 18 inch rail. I got the, the Opsync can, which isn't Opsync. It's actually Allen Engineering. Allen Engineering was manufacturing for Opsync. Opsync was selling it to the government, and um, that's what I have now. Um, actually, it's like right there. Oh, I, yeah. I so, something about that platform, man. I just, yeah, the fixed stock and everything. Like it's, it's mm-hmm. definitely on on my list of uh, like, and I don't even <clears throat> necessarily care about to go and clone correct with it. Um, I at I was ready to pull the trigger on. Uh, one of the Bravo company replica uppers mm-hmm. <laughs> and my uh, wife put a stop to that one pretty quick when she realized how much it was. <clears throat> so I'm like, all right, well, they're, they're, they're not cheap. Yeah. It's just so, one of those things, you know, like you got to do it <laughs> or I have to anyways. I, so I, I, I did find a problem though with it. It's heavy. Yeah. It's, it's really heavy. So then you know, I was like looking into clone stuff. I, was, I really caught my attention and the whole recce concept was really blowing up. And then I found the Holland and I was like, well, wait a minute. This is cool. I can use my suppressor. I can um, make it shorter. It's lighter. And I just really fell in love with that platform. So 16 inch barrel without the can, carbon fiber PRI rail, you know, didn't have some of the heavy nuances of the of the Mark 12 Mod 1 or even the Mod Zero. Um, I have an, a Magpul CTR stock, and I went with a Leupold 3 to 10. So that's probably my end of the world rifle. If I'm going to go for any gun, I'm going for that one because it does a bunch of jobs. It does a lot of jobs pretty well. Yeah. No, and and. <clears throat> that's kind of what I was getting at earlier. Um, I think that once people kind of discovered that that was a viable platform, you didn't have to shoot distance with a super large caliber or have some kind of like, you know, over the top setup for that. I think it's really taken off in popularity. And I think that, um, I mean, for good reason, right? If you look at what most people do today in shooting um, or, I mean, with everything that went on like the last year, right? With all the awesome um, protesting or rioting more accurately. Um, you know, I mean, you're not going to necessarily need to shoot out to a thousand yards, but something with, uh, some kind of a magnified optic would be good. Um, and then five, five, six, well, we thought would be everywhere and readily available. The, the lockdown proved yeah. that that was, <laughs> that was false. And, uh, we ran out of ammo pretty quick with it. But I, I think that that whole, that concept and that platform, um, you know, I think that, it's kind of set the tone um, for where we're going to head in the future, you know? Um, and now we're seeing, I mean, it, I think it's kind of goofy. You're starting to see like some of these like one to eights and one to tens on like 10 and a half inch builds. <laughs> and I kind of start to question it a little bit only because, yeah, you know, at what point does it do is enough enough, right? Like you start to lose performance uh, out of the barrel to certain distances and things. And I know, you know, positive ID is important, but like, it just looks a little bit goofy, you know, these like micro reccees or which I think people, they call it whatever they want to call it. It's not a real thing. They call it like a micro Mark 12. Like, okay. So yeah. you, you made uh, something out of PVC and spray painted it. That kind of looks <laughs> like it might be a handguard. And then, you know, you threw your suppressor on it. And it's like, you know, I mean, props for the ingenuity, but you know, yeah, really. I have a photo coming out that is kind of a play on that. Oh, really? But. Yeah, I, I took my Mark 18 and threw a uh, um, a one to six on. I'm gonna call it like a micro recce, and it, it, that that's for funsies. You know, that's just playing around with photos and stuff like that. But you know, um, the gun I posted the other day uh, was it was it Monday? Yeah, I think it was Monday. Um, it's definitely like my go-to rifle. It, it makes the most sense, 16 inch. Like you can you can get up close and personal with the 16 inches is a mark 12 or you get a little bit more wieldy um but for the most part, just think of for the earlier years of gwat and all that kind of stuff again i'm not a military guy but you know those guys were kicking in doors with 
14 inch guns and, and yeah. shoot even Marines were Marines at Fallujah with, with 20 inches. So, right. um, I mean, it's, it's possible you can do it. So for your run of the mill everyday civilian gun guy, I mean, it's, it's a, I think a really good platform that covers a lot of the bases without having to have multiple guns and you can do multiple things with it. So if you do want, you know, extended range with an optic, you can now with hollow sun and all that stuff, you can really get into an offset red dot at a fairly inexpensive price and get yeah. a lot of that stuff built in. I mean, you can go with, you know, the Trigicon or, I mean, if you can find old MRD, the, the MRDS I have on mine is more for like clone stuff. Is it the best yeah. red dot? No, but I was able to get it fairly like really cheap. It's cheaper than even a Holliston because it's a surplus and, item. And those were like um, the, the old Insight ones, the MRDS, right? Or yeah, Insight, Insight, Insight or yeah. EOTech, yeah. And yeah, you used to be able to find those for like honestly pretty cheap. Sure, but, and then as soon as, like you said, as soon as Lone Survivor came out and then this like whole clone thing just really started blowing up, everyone's like, well, yeah, I mean, the performance is way shittier than the new stuff on the market, but it's got that cool factor, so I got to have it, you know? And um, it's I mean, funny. It works. Like, I mean, it's got three settings as opposed to like you know even the holosun now for almost the same money you've got night vision settings and all that stuff so yeah and um right when i we right when my twin brother and i got into shooting um he bought a like a glock 19 and i don't even maybe it was like optics planet or someplace awful that you i mean it was a goofy site and it was the only time we ever ordered anything off of it so i I actually do think we have an optics planet he actually was able to order an insight like pistol weapons light and um we didn't know what we had right at first. And, you know, a couple of years later, I'm looking, you know, on these clone pages and I'm, I'm looking at this pistol, you know, going back to the clone. I'm like, Hey, you know, I think you might, I think you might want to yeah. take that off your pistol. <laughs> well, well, why? I'm like, well, um, for one, I mean, the performance on it sucks, but for two, um, that might actually be worth more money than you realize than either of us realize. Like you showed him all this stuff. So now it's just chilling on a shelf somewhere in his basement or something until he figures out what he's going to do with it. But it's crazy, like, you know, and how much people pay for that now. And I, I mean, I'm not going to ask how much you paid for yours, but how many hours did you, like, put into the research and, like, searching for all the pieces to build it? Because that's, I mean. Which one? Um, I guess the, the, Hollander, your, the your first one. Um, most of the pieces were pretty easy to get together because I was doing it early on before it really blew up and became hard to find. I mean, the hardest thing was the rail. I mean, that was absolutely the hardest part to find. Um, That one was actually pretty easy. My Mark 12 Holland, I built a few years after. But again, it took me three years to build it. You know, I had a skeleton pretty much all assembled other than a rail. Um, And yeah, there there is time that you've put into it. You know, you have to kind of learn the sites that are going to have certain things. Things and um, it's a lot different now. Things move so much faster now compared to when I was doing it. Um, there's so many more people now cloning. It's it's near impossible. Like I don't know how some of the guys are doing it now. And you know, there there's certain prices that they're paying that I just refuse to pay. Like I won't do that. Um, yeah. There's just too much money. Um, I'm kind of running into that problem right now with a. I want to build a uh, Gordon clone. And oh yeah, no, those are yeah, those are. Actually, they're pretty popular right now, mm-hmm. um, but I mean, I think for good reason. I think uh, like I, I would love to even just an inspired build, right? Not even like an actual clone, <laughs> but just an inspired build for that. And I and I love that movie. I was like, yeah, I could totally do this. And I started looking into what you know some of that costs, and I'm like, okay, maybe I'll just do an inspired build. And even at that, being able to get parts for this, it's like you're still paying a ton. It's probably for the same reason, right? People, if they can't get the real clone, they want to get as close as they can. And it just drives the prices up, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember when I was in the industry, like people that had a one uppers wanted nothing to do with their a one uppers. They were, they're coming in like, Oh, they give them the gunsmith. They go, I want a side top so I can, you know, put, you know, an optic and a flip up sight on it. And we're like essentially throwing those away. And like now, I mean, something that was going for like less than a hundred bucks is going for, two, three, four hundred dollars for, for an upper. If it's like, you know, a Colt one that's got the right forge markings on it and all that stuff, it's just going for crazy money when we were, we were literally throwing those away. And now they're just, I mean, they're invaluable now. And I'm right. like, I'm, I'm really running that issue. And, and the barrels too, like I, I want to get a barrel to cut down and I want to get a Colt Socom barrel, 14 inch. And those are pretty abundant. Now they're, 
you know, used ones are going for like 200 bucks, 300 bucks. I'm like, man, am yeah. I going to finish this rifle? And but, it, I mean, the whole industry is in. I mean, in any of it, really. It's it down now. It goes into, like, so <clears throat> I remember ordering um, just some rail covers, right? Some Knights rail covers and a, and a broomstick grip. And I think cumulatively when I bought it, I spent maybe 30 bucks. And it was like six of the rail covers and it came in like that plastic roll or whatever. Yep. And then the the broomstick grip and I got it, you know, two separate purchases on eBay for like, could have been more than 35 bucks shipped. Like, okay, cool. No problem. <clears throat> like eight months later, I'm on there looking around because my, my brother wanted one. I'm like, all right, well, you, they were like 10 bucks. I'll go find you one. You cannot touch one now cheaper than like $60. And yeah. I'm like, and this was, this is only within the last two or three years that I had that issue. It's a, I was almost like, what, did somebody find like a, a warehouse full of these things and they were super cheap for six months and then they went back to being, you know, no, they were always cheap. It was I mean, like those M5 Rast rails uh, the, for the 16 inch, for the 20 inch barrels. Um, concealed carry journey had that dissipator and he was asking about like how to, you know, how he, I would mount a, uh, a forward grip on it or something like that and i was like yeah i was like do like a like a cack ra- you know rass rail you know they're like a dime a dozen and i hadn't looked into them and like they were like three hundred dollars now i'm like well wait a minute these things you could pick them up for like a hundred bucks you know right and now they're just going for crazy money and i was like whoops sorry about that like i mean that stuff used to be all really cheap because like right now and it's social media that's driving it. Um, the, the the carry handle stuff, you know, the, the twenty inch guns, like you know, I've been I, I took it took me like three four years to build my my twenty inch gun because it's all Nevesky parts and I wanted a Nevesky barrel but I couldn't get a government profile you know Nevesky barrel that was twenty inch I could I could put a um, a front sight post on all that kind of stuff so I ended up settling on a FN barrel, everything else is Nevesky. Um, yeah. But that took me years to build. And I'm glad I finished it when I did because I bought the barrel because I saw prices starting to creep up. And I'm like, wait, hold the phone. Like, what's going on here? And, you know, yeah. carry handles, 20-inch guns, you know, um, A1, A2 uppers are all just through the roof now. Yeah, you can't you can't find them. I mean, I think Brownells might be onto something now with they're trying to like, you know, do the whole retro thing. Um, <clears throat> but even those, they're not, they're not cheap, right? They're, they're still, they're still pretty expensive for what they are. And I honestly don't see it getting any better really. Um, and it's just funny, right? Cause it's none of that stuff's actually any better than what's available to the civilian market. You know, my, um, <clears throat> my co-host here uh, spent about six years in the, in the service and he thinks it's absolutely hilarious. He's like, are you kidding me? I, we used to like throw boxes of this shit away. It's like, had I known what this stuff was going to be worth when I got out, I probably would have tried to save some of it. But like they, he told me he, one day he had a buddy that was cleaning out, um, some kind of locker or storage room. And they had a box of like these Leopold three time magnification optics. I don't even know which one it was, but he, he had one, um, and he wound up selling it. He's like, yeah, we threw out like nine of them. Because we just we didn't use them on anything, and uh, now I mean shit, they go for six seven hundred bucks, and I mean they kind of sucked, but people want them, so you know. Of course, though, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble with that. I'm told uh, <laughs> taking yeah. stuff from the government, even if they're getting rid of it. So yeah, be careful, and uh, <clears throat> you know, which again I don't get. You know, if they're gonna get rid of it, why not sell it to the civilian market? Yeah, open up the market to it. Yeah, I I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, honestly, save some tax dollars. <laughs> Right, right, right. Making that money back. Um, it, it's really, again, it's, it's driven by social media, um, all of that. Um, I mean, there's a few guys that I follow that are, have been doing that stuff, like M57 Fire and Vice, and Executive Outcomes now what is an administrative result. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, he, like the blood diamond car and all that kind of stuff. And it just starts rolling in, like, some of these bigger accounts that gain popularity. I'm just going to rephrase that medium sized accounts that gain popularity. I really feel like drive the market because like a lot of the like, really big guys aren't doing that kind of stuff. No, they're not, you know, and you look at like the medium count guys, people feel like it's attainable and like, okay, I can do this. And I, I really feel like they have more influence 
on obscure stuff than some of the bigger guys do because they're they're just not touching it. No, I I think that's 100 percent it. And there's been because of that, there's there's more of those you know uh, middle sized accounts, right? Mm-hmm. So there's just a it's just a, that much of a larger following for things like that. Um, <clears throat> you know, and I've seen the videos on the um, the blood diamond build that uh, mm-hmm. you know administrative results did. Um, and I had actually not that that actually drove me to go like seek that movie out because I'd never seen it. Um, and he did a pretty good job with it. I think he said there's only a couple parts on it that weren't actually clone correct, like the um, I think he said the light mount and maybe like the flash hider or something that was on it weren't okay. clone correct, but everything else was pretty close. Yeah. You know, and um, even with uh, you know the Mark 18 stuff, right? Getting away from the Mark 12s, looking at Mark 18, it's the same issues we run into. Um, <clears throat> finding the rails. I mean, the Daniel Defense RAS, uh, RIS, RAS, whichever, um, is still really easy to get a hold of, but because the demand is there, they can charge, you know, probably double what it's worth. Um, mm-hmm. And, I mean, if you're trying to find, like, you know, a Knight's rail, I mean, forget about it. I, I've not seen the actual carbine length drop in um, under 200 bucks. I, It's been a while. And, I mean, really, you can get something super comparable, right? Something pretty high quality, um, brand new, not beat to shit, um, from like Troy or Midwest Industries, and it's a hundred bucks all day. Yep. Yeah, give or take, like maybe a hundred and ten, hundred and twenty, but it's around a hundred dollar mark. Um, so I mean, it's it has nothing to do with the functionality. It's got everything to do with just the cool factor, right? Mhm. Yeah, my my Mark 18 is probably my most like non clone correct gun. It's a it's complete game defense. Uh, Again, when I was, I bought it, it, and again, I was in the industry, so I had, like, super heavy discounts and all that kind of stuff, which is great. Yeah. Um, the manufacturers used to offer really good stuff. You know, I had my Surefire. My Surefire is technically not clone correct because it's a 7.62 can and not the 5.56, but it works. I like it because I can put on different guns. Yeah. I do sacrifice some. I sacrifice some sound, but I, I like the, the ability to put her on 5.56 or 7.62. But that gun, you know, I don't care. It's like, that's. Probably my second favorite gun is my Mark 18, um, but for a small gun, she's heavy. Like it's there's a lot in because that 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 Danny Defense rail is heavy. Oh yeah, yeah. It's old tech. Like compared to now, you can build a gun way lighter and way cheaper than trying to clone that. But yeah, there's a fun I mean, factor. But I think you <clears throat> you gain a lot in terms of durability. You know, um, mm-hmm. in protecting the barrel, keeping you know if you're running the IR laser. Uh, you know, keeping your zero, you don't have to worry about you know, if you drop it down a hill or something, it's not going to bend the the handguard. I mean, it's probably going to get, you know, pretty fucked up, but it, yeah. you know, your you know, the stuff that matters is is still going to be there, right? Your barrel's not going to be jacked up because the handguard had the integrity. Um, you know, your, your lasers are going to hold their zero. Um, you shouldn't be mounting an optic out on the rail, but I mean, I've seen people do it. So, you know, just having a yeah. good quality, you know, I run a, um, the BCM quad rail on mine and it is it's it's beefy compared to like their M lock rail. I almost couldn't believe it. I was actually kinda of pissed when I got it. I'm like, man, this thing's gonna weigh a shitload uh all put together and it does. 30. It it it's uh it, it was I like to say that it's Mark eighteen inspired. It's like an eleven and a half inch okay. um with the you know the quad rail and, and stuff and I um because I like the look of the Mark eighteen. I just can't bring myself to spend what a Mark eighteen costs now that I can you know mm-hmm. I have the access to that kind of funds when i started building it like three years ago or started started building my ar pistol getting close to something like that i was like there's no way there's no way i can justify you know 250 on a rail or any of this stuff and you know with a wedding coming up and all that um sure so, uh, and, and i think it's a lot of it too it's like you know we talked about this with the you know, little journey and i talked to, spoke about this it's just you know there's a fine line between like you know getting good stuff having stuff and budgets and all that kind of stuff so like you know you have to factor in you know when is being cool you know <laughs> right by, like, you know what i mean yeah and i think you know i mean we, we all have like that spending problem a little bit but yeah i can't i can't just like i can't look at my wife and be like hey um i know that you really want to go on vacation but um or, or remodel the bathroom because we're in the middle of doing that you know, but um, instead, I'm gonna go ahead and buy this rifle, and um, yeah, it's, it's just gonna, gonna sit it. here. <laughs> yeah, it's not gonna work, or I won't be married very long, you know. And then I really won't be able to afford anything. 
right? So, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I think that the clone thing is, I mean, it's cool. I really enjoy wa- looking at everybody else doing it. Like, you guys go spend yeah. the money. I'll learn what I can learn from you and, and all that. But I think that um, <clears throat> it's not for everyone, and I fall into everyone. Uh, like, I'm not... <laughs> Yeah. It's not really my bad. I would not be cloning now. You know, I, I cloned much earlier on and, you know, did it when it was way less expensive. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I wouldn't be cloning at, at this point. Like, I'm trying to do that with that, that Gordon rifle, and I'm like, I'm really struggling because I'm like, nope, not going to spend that. I'll wait it out. I mean, I've got some of the key components that are hard to get. Like, I got the collar from D. Wilson when he released some with mm-hmm. um, Allen Engineering, so I was able to snag that. So I've got a few key components like I'm probably gonna go the um the Brownells upper, honestly. Yeah. It's probably the way I'm gonna do it. Um I'd like a Colt, but I'm just you know, there's there's a fine line where I'm like, Yeah, that's that's too much. Because like I said, I cloned a lot of my stuff when, when stuff wasn't expensive. Yeah, I mean you can justify a little you know, to an extent, right? Like you can like I could eat a, a, a bit, right? You know what I mean? Over MSRP, I'm not gonna make that big of a deal about it. I understand supply and demand. But yeah, some of it just gets to the point like, you know, it's the, yeah, it, it it is it's just a a tool, right? If anything were to happen, like you kind of got to weigh the pros and the cons on it. What um what uh, Mark eighteen did you end up building? Like a mod it's zero, a, or I just kind of slapped it's together. So it's, yeah, it's slapped together. It's uh it's a Nevesky lower on top of a Daniel Defense complete upper with Daniel Defense fixed sights. Um, a Magpul CTR and a Aimpoint Comp Comp M4. Which, yeah, the M4. Yeah. Not the real expensive one. The older so, one. Yeah, yeah the, it's like the they call it the what the Aimpoint Pro now. Yeah, yeah, essentially what the Aimpoint Pro now is. Yeah. Yeah, and those aren't bad optics. Honestly, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think those things kind of get a bad rap because they're just they're bigger and they're bulkier. They're big. They're but, old. Yeah, but I mean, hey, it works. It's reliable. I think that, uh, you know, seeing some of the other stuff that floats around on the internet, more people could uh, spend money on something like that instead of some of these. Uh, like, I, and I don't like to rip on like Hollow Sun, but they're um, like EOTech comparable enclosed holographic optic. I've heard a ton of problems with that, or even like really? the first gen Hueys that uh, that Vortex made, you know, weren't weren't, weren't awesome. Good, yeah. And those you're you're at a comparable price point. You're actually you're actually spending uh, more, I think, on those holographic ones than you would on one of these Aimpoint Pros that you can get for around three hundred bucks. <clears throat> yeah. Versus uh, you know like a brand new, um, like I said, the Vortex Huey, um, or even one of the older gen uh, EOTex, brand new out of the box. And those aren't. I've heard mixed reviews on those, honestly. Like the um, just the, the clarity of the reticle. Um, mm-hmm. The, you know it's very fuzzy and personally I don't like a, I don't like a clouded sight picture I'd rather just go with a red dot. Um, Me too. Uh, then, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I I, I think the Endpoint Pro is probably your best like best for your bang quality object. You're gonna pay what three fifty to four hundred bucks I think for it. Something like that. Me you might be able to find it a little bit less on sale or it something on holiday. Okay. I, I mean that that's a no brainer. That's something that's gonna it has long battery life. It's tough. It's Good quality. I mean, that's probably the best way to go if you're just going to go with the red dot. Um, I've got a, I've got one Hollow Sun like Aimpoint T1 or yeah, yeah T1 kind of clone. That one's been good, but again, it, it's it's on like a PCC that I it's on a Strybog. It's not like my end all be all like rifle or gun. So yeah, I pick and choose what I, I put that on. Like the, the PCC is like a fun novelty thing, you know. I want to shoot nine millimeter. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, for something I'm going to grab if something was to go down. Yeah, my Mark 18 is my bedside gun. So, sure. you know, so it's got the aim point on it. So it it was clone and also function because I, I know that optic is, is, is tough. It's reliable. So, and I was able to, you know, get it fairly inexpensively. You know, it's got some scratches. It was definitely a surplus item, but um, it's, a, it's good quality. So, I mean, I, I think there's good ways you can spend your money and I think for a new gun owner, a uh, Aimpoint Pro is probably the best way to go. Yeah, and I mean, and it's and it's not a dig, right? You know, what I mean, like I think Hollow Sun does, has done a pretty good job in the past couple of years coming around with like uh, that 
I don't want to call it like a T2 clone, but it basically is, right? Mm -hmm. It's basically a clone of T2. Like on mine, I have a, um, the Vortex Crossfire 2, which is, again, it's like a mm -hmm. T2 clone. It doesn't have the Shake Awake. Um, very basic. I saw a lot of like drop test videos and stuff on it before I finally was like, all right, I'll try it for 150 bucks. Um, it's actually been really good so far. I have zero complaints on it. Um, <clears throat> if I were to do it again, I would probably spend a little bit more on something else. Um, but you know, for right now it's, it's not bad. And that's, um, I think, you know, if you're not trying to look at the clone thing, if you're trying to just look at something that's decent, you know, you have to spend a mm -hmm. little bit, you know, right around that $150, mm -hmm. $200 dollar mark. Um, but that'll get you like a pretty reliable red dot. That's got a good warranty behind it, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, <clears throat> looking at like, uh, we got the stimulus checks that came out. I, I am sure people use that to buy, uh, you know, I, I, sure. I know I, I picked up the vortex, uh, the Viper one to six, um, cause mm -hmm. I was rocking the, uh, strike Eagle going strike Eagle one to six before that. And I just didn't, yeah, care it's, uh, that's what I got right here. It's not bad. Some people really like to shit on the strike Eagle. And I'm like, man, for 200 bucks that I got, you know, I got it on sale yeah. for 200 bucks with a free mount. It's not awful. Um, I just, uh, the general. It does one, the job. It holds zero. Yeah. And, and I, I only changed it up because I didn't, I didn't love the reticle that it had. There's nothing wrong with it. I just, again, I'd like a more minimalist sight picture and the Viper just has, it's a little bit simpler to look through on a one to six. Now, um, some people are going to disagree with me on that and that's fine. I just, when I was getting behind that strike Eagle, I just saw like a big red blur. <laughs> I'm like, eh. yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I get what they're going for with it. I just, I didn't love it. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Uncle Joe bought me a new optic and, uh, now my wife yeah, has right. a strike Eagle one to six on her rifle and perfect. So it works out for everybody. Right. Perfect. And, and honestly, I think that, uh, and w with the warranty that Vortex has, right, like you can't like go wrong. Um, if something happens to it, they're going to take care of it. And they're a reputable, you know, manufacturer. I've not actually heard too many people say that they've had catastrophic issues with a Vortex optic. I mean, okay. no, there's, there's those stories out there, but um, I think as long as you stick to some of the good manufacturers, people are going to be at least okay with it. You know, uh, House on Red Dot, Vortex, I don't really care for like the spark or it does personal preference. Um, but, and then, you know, if you go up from there, Leopold, I actually, I really do want to pick up, uh, some Leopold glass for my six, five Creedmoor rifle, but, um, yeah, I only really have the extra $1,200. I, I did have now. an issue with, yeah, I actually did have an issue with the hollow sun optic. I had a sun. Oh, did you? Yeah. I had, uh, one of the early, um, 507 Ks for my Glock 43, mm -hmm. and it was working fine. A few range sessions, and then um, it wouldn't switch radicals. Um, get like the circle dot, the dot, and then the yeah, circle. Yeah. I think I had set it on the circle with the dot to try out, and I couldn't get it out of it. I would just, I would cycle through it and it would just the screen the the dot would disappear and come back disappear and come back wouldn't actually cycle through the different reticle options and did they did, but i mean like did they they took care of it right they weren't you didn't have any issues with it they took care of the warranty work yeah yeah now they sent me an rma i put it back in the box i sent it over to them and it wasn't the smoothest process um i'll admit that i, I did go to frustrated because they never updated me on what was going on. Um, because they're like, oh, we, cause I thought they were just going to send me a new one. I was going to send a new a deal one back. Um, that's what sure. I just thought it was going to be, but it's fine. And then the guy's like, oh, it'll be, you know, it'll probably take about like seven days, seven and 10 days to complete the process. All right. So I waited. I have to find the email. Like I got kind of spicy with me. And I waited like seven days. I'm like, hey, just want to make sure like it's okay because they didn't because they they had to approve it, you know, make sure that you know it wasn't something I did or or whatnot. And it was just I was kind of like left in the dark. And I was like, um, hey, you mentioned seven days. Can you look? You know, 
and there's supposed to be like a pro like they're supposed to send you an email when you receive it they received it. i never got an email when they received it and then i was like and then i waited some more and then it's a few more days i waited like another maybe a week after that and they were supposed to it's supposed to be done by then like i should have had it by then i was like hey yeah you know you said seven to ten days i waited 14 what are we doing am i getting a new one oh yeah it's it, it's shipping out right now okay <laughs> so, of course it was, there's more to it i, I don't remember the, the the details of it but it was a little frustrating it wasn't the um process it wasn't like surefire you know when i you know i had a, a light go out and that was like super easy see and that's and okay that makes me second guess some things because um I've really been looking at either getting my 43X uh, slide milled for the 507K or like buying uh, an aftermarket slide to put a 507K on and everything, like investing some money in in getting my carry gun uh, an optic. Um, and I was, I, honestly, I've been, I was pretty much sold like, hey, it's 507K. Everyone says that that's the way to go with these things and they're great. And um, <clears throat> I watched Sage Dynamics do a review on it, and as far as I'm concerned, if that guy puts a stamp of approval on a red dot, it's good enough for me. That's and, why I um, did it. But I know um, it's funny that you mentioned this because I was on Instagram uh, yesterday, the day before, and I saw um, uh, Citizens Response posted that that his 507k was having issues as well with like dot flickering and and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, well, I may mean, get that this stuff fails. You know, I mean, it's going to happen to some people eventually, right? Um, but it's just, it's it's funny that it's the, it seems like it's a, not exactly the same issue, but a related issue. <laughs> and I'm hearing about it just a couple of days apart. So like now I'm like, man, maybe I should just stick with the, you know, the uh, the irons that I'm running, the night sights that I have and just let it be. I mean, I mean, this one's mine. I haven't had an issue after I got the replacement. I mean, it works perfect. The Shake Lake works great. I mean... I've shot it and I haven't had any issues with it after that. So, um, so I have no complaints as far as getting, I mean, it took a little bit longer than I'd like and they weren't super clear. And like, I actually wrote them an email. I was like, Hey, listen, everything was good except like your, your comms are not good. Like your communication's not good. Your guy told me one thing and ended up being another and just, which is fine. I mean, I'm okay with, you know, it's not taking a little bit longer, but just, just, you know, I'm just trying to follow your process, so follow your process. That's all it yeah. goes for me. Yeah, so. and that's, that. I mean, I guess I can, I don't know, I, I, I'd try to give them the benefit of the doubt, because um, it does seem like in the past maybe two years here, they've really blown up with their pistol optics and stuff, so maybe just working in corporate America myself, where I know that communications are an assumed skill that <laughs> not everybody always has, Um it, it is unfortunate to hear though, because they're they're starting to get into market share, and they won that lawsuit with uh, um, I want to say it was Trigicon <clears throat> over the yeah. like the the red dot the pistol red dot design and everything. So now they're really making strides and everything. So how long ago did you have this issue with yours? Let me actually let me dig up on my phone and make an email. I'll, I'll let you know when exactly it was. Um... Yeah. Because I mean, and, and again, it's yeah, they've really come on to things in the past couple of years, right? So, um, trying to give them the benefit of the doubt, but I mean, really, and that's what, and I talked about this in a couple episodes ago um, after that whole Dakota Myers thing came out. But now that the mm-hmm. civilian market more than more than ever, I would say now the civilian market is driving the firearms industry, not the not so much the government contracts um, with stuff like that. Like your customer service has to be on point. Uh, it, it has mm-hmm. to be, you know, your your strongest asset. Look at companies like, um, you know, like okay, like T Rex Arms, right? And they do a lot of reselling. You know, they make their own holsters, yeah. but almost almost probably eighty percent of everything else they do there is reselling another company's product. But they're associated with the success and everything because they have mm-hmm. outstanding customer service. On the other hand, you got places like Optics Planet, which I fully expect to be out of business uh, in the next five years <laughs> because. I, I only ever hear terrible things about about that place. And it's like, you know, again, another reseller, you guys don't actually make anything of your own, but if you can't supply your customer demand, uh, you're kind of... Well, yeah. yeah. September of 2020. So not even a year ago. Okay. Man. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna have to... I'm going to have to... 
gonna have to look at that and uh <laughs> reevaluate some life choices here um because I, I i seriously i bought the the 43x i thought i was lucky for a while because i got it like the month or month and a half before lockdown set in and you couldn't find anything i was like all right well, cool i got mine before, you know ahead of the rush and then of course they come out in like september with the uh 43x mos don't even get me going with that. That I, same thing happened with me. That's my story. Yeah, I was because I, I had been carrying a a, a Gen One M and P shield, and I was like, okay, cool. I've been wanting to get out of it and get into a Glock and everything. And the 43X came out. I was like, you know, I'm gonna look into it. And then tax returns came back. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna go out and do this for myself. <laughs> and then mm-hmm. six months later. Oh, hey, look, optics ready with a light rail. And now you got, you know, lights that are well, better light than rail. 6 I, I and was stuff. so mad. Yeah, I'm yeah, I, I was I've, so mad. I have wasted uh, a lot of time and, and had a couple of sleepless nights, like, thinking of ways to try and, like, wonder if I could sell my 43X on consignment and then go buy a 43X MOS <laughs> and try and find a way into it, uh, you know, if it would make sense versus, like, milling out the slide and... I mean, the pistol light is really kind of what gets me the most because if you have the Gen 1, right, you're stuck with that TLR6, which is, I mean, it's like 150 lumens, right? And it all it does is just clamp onto your trigger guard. I don't have the utmost of faith in in that as far as reliability. That's um, yeah. You know, not that I was thrilled to hear that the Surefire light was 300 bucks, but, I mean, as long as you're getting a couple hundred lumens out of it... Much? Um, I think I saw it on sale for like two eighty nine. I know, and it's a super tiny light. I think it only gets you up to like three hundred lumens, but <clears throat> obviously, I'd still rather have that than a hundred or hundred and fifty. Um, yeah, I think so. I, I pretty much promised myself at this point, uh, <laughs> if any any handguns I buy from here on out will be optics ready, or I will not buy them. <laughs> I see. I got lucky. Um, it was another mistake that happened, and I actually got my optic cut for free on my 43X. I'm going to – I got to charge it. I don't want my laptop to die on you. Um, I actually had my – I sent one of my Glocks to get milled by a certain company, and I asked for the rear sights in front of the red dot. And um, – it took longer than they quoted, which I was fine, no big deal. But then I get the slide, and it's it's not right. Like, like oh, you know, we can um we can take the slide back and send you a 17 slide and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, is it going to be an OEM slide? And like, no. I'm like, okay, well, I don't want that because it's it's a technically a Glock 22 with a a conversion barrel on it and it shoots like i am very happy with the way that gun shoots and i was like yeah it's not going to work and i also want an oem slide because that slide was a tenor slide before they switched uh to whatever they're doing now and they're like oh well which just kind of got me because i mean at least from when i got trained at clock and all that kind of stuff the old tenor was a metal treatment process it's not actually the finish they Okay. They bathe it in, you know, in tenifer, and which they don't do anymore. So that's why you can take, you know, a Glock and knock older Glocks and knock the pol- uh, the finish off of them, and then. You know, oh wow! So I was like, well, you know, I don't want that. And the guy's like, okay, well, do you want another gun? Do you want to get anything else cut? I said, actually, you know, it doesn't really work. You know, I I I, I want to get a Glock. I have a Glock forty three. When the 507K becomes available, could you do that? I'm like, sure. So, um, call them. It was like months and months later. Call them up. They had forgotten, but I'd saved all my emails. And I was like, you guys, you're going to do this for me, please. Because you offered me a mistake. And here's the email. I was like, okay, cool. No problem. Cut the slide over and they cut it. I mean, I didn't do anything. I, I didn't try to take advantage of it or anything like that. Like, I just got it cut. And yeah coated one color and that's why i went in optics you know for a carry gun just because i had a chance for something yeah and that's yeah i mean i don't know i i really am pretty chapped that they i mean that i if i would have just waited a couple months i could have you know and i understand what it still would have been hard to get a hold of one um but it would have been worth it knowing that i wouldn't have to worry about uh 
getting it milled or um, mm-hmm. you know, like getting milled and then, okay, can I get it Cerakoted or can I get nitride? You know, cause I, I have friends that are doing it right now and they're like, yeah, I went through, I think he said he went, he was going through Jaeger works for one of them or something. And mm-hmm. he said, it's like, it's gonna be like six months before he gets his slide back. I'm like, well, uh. I'm like, dude, I can't do that. He's like, oh no, it's fine. Listen, just, just go buy yourself another gun to carry while you're having that one milled. I'm like that's not that easy. It's like this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Why wouldn't I just buy a 43x MOS then, and sell the 43x I have now? Like that doesn't make any sense. It's not that's a, that's a dumb idea. I can't even do what I normally do where I cycle down what I have to my wife because in January of this year, she went and bought a 43x. She finally got uh, away from her Springfield XDS, and uh, and bought oh. a Glock. Uh, I've been bugging her about that for like the last three years, and she finally did it. She said, oh, no, I like it. Like, listen, the people that like that, the sorry, the people that make that gun don't even like it. So just, you know, she that that uh, it was the second stimulus I think came out, and she was looking. And she's like, well, maybe I'll get the Hellcat. I was like, listen, no, we will quite possibly have a discussion about divorce if you bring another Springfield into this house. Like, look at the Sig P365. Look at the Glock 43X. At that time, I don't, yeah, the, the Shield Plus wasn't out yet. I'm like, look at one of those two. I'm like, I will fully endorse and and be, you know, over the moon happy if you go with either of those options. Do not bring another Springfield into this house. And uh, I think she, she went up going with the 43X. Now it's just kind of convenient. We can, like, you know, I, EDC being what it is and everything. Now we can share magazines if we need to mm-hmm. and, and all that stuff. And so I... You know, I was like, oh, I'm so happy you bought this. Here, I went out and spent like 60 bucks and got her night sights and put them on. <laughs> so, what is this for? I'm like, because I'm proud of you for making the right choice <laughs> and buying a Glock. <laughs> you know, and I just, I, yeah, man, because I, I, I really didn't, I, I really don't want to go with like the Shield RMSC or the the RMR CC. You know, the other mm-hmm. concealed optics right now. Um, I know Shield's been around doing their stuff for a while, but the the RMR just seems it's kind of big. You know, for what it is, I think it is too. Um, and it's and it's pricey, man. It's really, really pricey. Yeah, it's like double the price of the 507k. I think you're right around 500 mm-hmm. bucks, and the 507k you can get. I think I, the cheapest I've seen it on on sale was like 230. Yeah. And it kind of, I think it usually sits around the 275 mark, which I, I honestly don't think it's that bad if it's going to be a reliable, you know, compact optic and everything and for the most part, it seems like it's pretty much the standard if you can get a hold of it. You know, I don't have a problem paying 250 or 275 for it. I can I can deal with that, especially because it's through Amazon, so I could just I'll have it like two days after I order it. That to me is worth like 20 bucks. Mm-hmm. So I might still do it though. I think that you know with carry guns and stuff right now, I'm I'm a little bit torn between trying to make it as minimalist as I can and then wanting a red dot because <clears throat> mm-hmm. I run. My Glock 19 has really Yeah, I mean, my Glock 19 has RMR on it, and I love it. I did it on a whim. Uh, I bought the 19 MOS. I originally had like a Vortex Venom on it, and mm-hmm. um, I just one day I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna buy myself something nice, and I bought an RMR. I'm mm-hmm. Like, well, this was worth it. This is definitely worth yeah. it. So now the definitely the uh, yeah. the Venom lives on the. Uh, I bought one of the um, Arasaka offset mounts. And it lives on my uh, mm-hmm. 16 inch recce build with that uh, Viper 1 to 6. And uh, I think, I think, I mean, it works. I would rather have an enclosed red dot, but uh, mm-hmm. I mean, $250 worth of optic just sitting around, I'm not going to not use it, right? Uh, no, no, I, I, yeah, that's what I would do. So, that's I mean, what I would do. And I think that the biggest thing, at least with looking at pistol-mounted optics, that I've noticed is the body of it. If it sits high enough that you can't use suppressor height sights as like a backup, the RMR and then the um, the RMR and the Hollow Sun. I think the body of them is actually like low enough profile that you can actually index your sights over them. Mm-hmm. At least if you have um, if you have the rear sight behind the optic. I know you were talking about putting it in front of the yeah. optic, and that might actually be more convenient um but i think the only way to either do that is you know a custom cut or if you get one of those uh was at the atom slides that uh i think unity yeah used to which are impossible to get 
Right. The last time I looked, they were out of stock. It, it, do they still make them? I think they do. But I, I, so the, they they're on a different generation, if I'm not mistaken. They, they should still be making them. I thought that was a really cool idea, where they just take like the whole chunk off the back of the slide, and you can do whatever you want with the optic and the sight configuration. It just depends on the plate. Um, yeah, hopefully they come back in stock some kind of soon. But I mean, uh, it's still again pretty pricey. You're gonna pay like nine hundred dollars for that slide, and then you're gonna pay for the plate and the optic. And by the time you're done with that, you're probably close to two grand into it, right? Uh, oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I don't know if it's really that much better um, performance-wise, or if it just gives you the the ability to swap those out easier. Um, mm-hmm. cause the, the MOS package, at least for Glock and, uh, I've never really played with the Smith one, but, um, Smith and Wesson, I know the MOS is not the world's greatest offering when it comes to modular optics. Um, definitely has its limitations. I think, you know, uh, was it CP, CPHS or something? Uh, the company yeah. that comes out with all the aftermarket plates. I think if if anyone's like looking into running optics on a MOS, you have to upgrade the plate because those factory ones. Yeah, the plate's are... garbage. It's like stamped like pot metal. And I didn't realize that when I first mounted mine, and I I did what everybody does, right? You start tightening down the screws, thinking, okay, well I just need to do you know torque these, and mm-hmm. same thing, like that plate flexes, and it actually starts because the screws are too long and they don't tell you about it. Um, it starts pushing the back the 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 ass end of the optic upward which starts effing with your zero and everything. I'm like, yeah, this isn't, this isn't right. I need to, you know, so you gotta run out and drop 60 bucks on the plate, but it's worth it, right? It holds it in place. It fills out that gap in between the front and the back of the cut. So I think Glock would have done a better job with, you know, especially with their claims to perfection. I mean, I'm going to go there, but I mean, Glock, <laughs> they've, they've revolutionized the industry. I mean, Glock has changed, changed, handguns I mean, oh, without a note. um and it's it, i found it so half-assed that plate in comparison to everything else the way they do you know what i mean yeah no i i agree well and even in comparison to what their competitors are starting to do um like uh fn just came out with their modular optic system that yep. again stage dynamics helped design um seeing what unity tactical came out with um you know, and and I get that you're not going to just jump at the first good idea that comes out, but it's been long enough now. And I mean, like you said, Glock is they're the they're the standard, right? They're the industry leader. Um, you really should recognize when it's time to make some changes. Uh, I think sometimes in that regard, they're a little bit behind the ball. Uh, the whole finger grooves thing, or like slide serrations, or hell, even just ambidextrous controls. <laughs> you know, it, it took them yeah. to Generation Five to get to that, and You've had companies like Ruger doing it for a while, and I. No, I agree. Don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating for Ruger. I think Ruger has a bunch of issues, but uh, you know they they figured it out. Smith and Wesson figured it out. Um, mm-hmm. You know, those are your competitors. You're gonna, I mean, risk losing market share just from a purely business business standpoint. Business, uh, uh, yeah, they're they're definitely slow to change. I, I think maybe it's because of that whole. Bit like the company I work for, um, we're big, I'm in lumber and you know, we're, we're the big dog in the game. We're one of the big dogs of the game. We are slow to make changes. We're, we're, we're not as rapid as, you know, some smaller companies that can make on the fly changes. And I think Glock has kind of become, become that they're the big behemoth and, you know, they're like a big oil tanker. You know, it takes a while to slow down and change direction. Um, what surprises me with, you know, the, the optics plate was that, you know, they made the direction change as far as going into optics and didn't perfect it. Like didn't, you know, how did they not catch? Yeah, exactly. Like that to me just seems so bizarre because they just seem like a company that would put the R and D, you know, really make sure the product's good before releasing it. Because again, they're like Apple, they don't release huge changes. You know, it's, it's incremental. But typically when <clears throat> Apple does something and they get into something, they usually try to be equivalent or better to what that, you know, what everybody right. else is doing. They try to find something a little bit different, make it a little bit better. And I, I thought Glock would have done that and like to have those plates kind of 
break and, well, and it was, especially it was especially because their 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 hallmark right like is is that um and i always think of the movie u.s marshals right when Tommy Lee jones talks about how you can fill a glock with sand and it'll still fire and that's that's their you know that's their thing is just like unbeatable reliability and that's why everyone loves them that's why law enforcement and the military choose them well some parts of the military anyway and a lot of law enforcement but um so if, if you're building your whole reputation on reliability, it, it's, it does seem a bit short-sighted to look at something like your optics mounting uh, abilities and and not make that adjustment. And, and the MOS package has been out for, <clears throat> what, since uh, Gen 4. We're now in Gen 5. Mm -hmm. And they have not changed. They're still selling that same plate pack. And it's like, mm -hmm. okay, so I mean... Is there an actual problem with it? If, I think if you just change the materials, a lot of the griping would go away. Mm -hmm. And just maybe throw a disclaimer on there. Hey, um, you may have to get factory, or uh, you may have to get different screws for your optic. You may have to cut down your screws. Um, I think that in itself, though, if they just change from that, like you're saying, that pot metal to, mm -hmm. I don't know, steel or, or something just, just more robust that's not going to um, be so shitty. I mean, it was a, the CW, I think they do a polymer one. I mean, there's a polymer plate that someone makes. Is it them or is it somebody sad. else? It's supposed to be good. Um, is that the one that has, like, the face on it? It, like, comes up from under the optic and puts a face in front of the optic to protect it from damage? I think so. And yeah. Sage Dynamics reviewed it, and it was it was, it was good. It was, like, they're good. Yeah. So it's, you know, glass, it's not undoable. Do it. Yeah, I mean, like, put the, I mean, it almost makes you question, like, how much R&D did you guys actually put into this, right? I mean, if you rolled this out to market, it did you not find these issues, or did you just not care, or is there some secret to this that we're, we're missing? Um, you know, I and I've, think so. I mean, because I, and it's funny, because you talk to the people at Glock about this, like, uh, Damien from Concealed Journey was telling me, uh, he works at a gun shop, he was telling the uh, Glock rep, hey, I love Glocks, but your guys' sights are garbage. I, I, they're just, they're awful. When are you guys gonna do something about it, or when are you gonna offer something with night sights? He, and the guy's response, almost like it's a scripted corporate response, right? Is, oh, well, our sights are fine. You just need to shoot with them more. It's like, well, that's, I mean, yeah. I mean, if you do more of anything, you're gonna get better at it. That doesn't mean that that's a good option. It just means that you're used to dealing with, you know, a, a, a subpar uh, system. You, just, you learn how to survive and how to thrive in that system. And, and maybe you're right. Maybe it just comes back to uh, they're just slow to change because the size of the company and how many, um, for lack of a better phrase, you know, checks and balances are in place when they try to roll stuff like that out. I mean, hopefully soon, right? Yeah. Hopefully we see, we see some of those improvements because I, I think carry, carry optics are here to stay, obviously. I don't think it's one of those, like, uh, you know, fads or something that's going to pass in the next year or two. They're here to stay. It's a matter of time before the optic is integrated into the slide. I think is what, yeah. what we'll see next. I, I agree. Yeah. I think I, I, I'm interested to see what that would look like. But I think you're right. <clears throat> I think um, if you can, I mean, and honestly, I think the first one who might be able to do it uh, might be Smith and Wesson only because they own Crimson Trace now. So you have all the the optic and laser and light technology. You own obviously the firearms manufacturing uh, piece of that. If I had to bet on it, I would say they're probably going to be the first one to roll it out. Now I I don't necessarily think that it's going to be great, but you know the first uh, the first concept of all those start. things really is. I mean. The shield mini, you know, the shield mini red dots. I mean, they weren't the greatest, but they were the first ones really to to hit it. Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a good point. And and honestly, uh, they actually still do uh, several things better than some of the other ones on the market. Like mm -hmm. I, I love my RMR, but for the life of me, I I cannot understand how no one figured out like a side entry battery uh, hatch until last year. Yeah, uh, awesome. I hate that I'm going to have to take that thing off and change the battery and then re-zero it all over again. It's like, I shouldn't, it, this should be easier. Or even, you know, there's other optics, I know Delta Point and, and Vortex, they do the top mount battery hatch. Yep. You know, why, I mean, and maybe, you know, to my bitching about the, the height of the optic earlier, maybe that's why they're so much thicker and beefier is because you don't have to remove the optic to get to the battery. Um, 
I'm not, you know, but Holston was able to do that with a 507k. You know, they've got side mount. You can use OEM height sights. You don't have to go with, you know, um, with a suppressor height sight. Yeah, and that's and, honestly, and that's what really attracted me to that is just how slim the profile was because. I know you can get away with concealed carrying something like a 19 or a 17 with a, mm-hmm. a hollow sun and suppressor height sights. Personally, I don't really want to. Um, it just it seems a little bit uncomfortable, at least, mm-hmm. you know, in the warm. I mean, in the warm weather um, here in Michigan, we only get a couple of months of, of real bad heat. But when we do have it surrounded by water, the humidity is pretty shitty. And I I just I don't want to have a huge gun in my waistband. Uh, I'm okay with the 43x plus, you know, I actually shoot the 43x pretty well, so I'm not worried about it. Um, and now with the Shield magazine, the Shield 15 or the yeah, the Shield arms, yeah, right. Shield, yeah, the S15. The S15 um, mag. Yeah, my wife and I actually we pre-ordered a couple weeks ago. We just got our S15s in the mail like this week, and then uh, is it this week or? Yeah, and then uh, she she told me like over the weekend. She, oh, by the way, I ordered a box of ammo. She got four boxes of. Uh, of a Hornady yep. uh, critical defense. And uh, I was like, oh, sweet. I sat down last night to load those things up. And I wonder if on the Gen 2s with the S15 mags, they didn't um, change the springs. Because I really had to work to get those last four rounds in. Really? Um, yeah. Uh, I have one of those. Uh, I have the uh, the Ablula, the, the mag mm-hmm. loader tool, which I usually don't use. Um, but I was glad I had it. The last round on hers, it... Yeah, I was like, is there something wrong with this? <laughs> Did the spring bind or something? It's that bad. Uh, it was pretty tough, uh, but, you know, we'll give it some time. We'll see how it is. I mean, um, I know when people were complaining about the Gen 1s, the follower and spring were the number one culprits that they had. So maybe a, a stronger spring is just the solution. Um, and if that's going to give me, you know, more reliability, they're, after the spring breaks in, I'm sure it'll be fine. So Yeah, it should, it should loosen up a little bit, yeah. But again, that just goes back to show you, like, look at all the success that Shield Arms is having out of those things. And if Glock would just get away from those polymer mags, like, hey, you guys could be, you know, <clears throat> taking the market by storm. That's why everyone ran to the Hellcat and the 365, right? It was the small package and the large capacity. And mm-hmm. they roll out a 10-rounder. <laughs> it's like, well, yep. it's better than the 6 you had in the 43. Yes. However, you're still, you know, you're still three rounds short of the smaller guns. Um, yep. And I don't, I mean, it's it's fine. You know, Shield Arms rolled their thing out. And I honestly, I, the capacity was not why I opted for it. I'm a bigger guy. I have bigger hands. So having a wider grip, a little bit longer grip was was definitely the right decision. Um, I don't know if you ever shot the M&P Shield. Not, mm-hmm. not the, I had the, one. Uh, not the beefiest frame in the world, and I did not no. shoot it very well. I hated that gun, honestly. I still have it. I don't know if I'll ever shoot it again, but uh, yeah, I definitely should have. Uh, yeah, I'm not a fan. I, I sold mine. I, I didn't like it. Um, I actually, it's funny that I, I went from a Shield Nine to a Glock 42 for the longest time. I went to the 380 for a little bit. Really? Yeah, actually, that, for a lot of it. Is that just? You wanted a Glock, or I mean, um, I I wanted the because the forty two. I mean, when the forty two first came out, that was like, whoa, Glock's doing a single stack, so, you know. And I, I'm okay with with three eighty. I, I know a lot of people aren't. Um, Guilty. But, I definitely uh, shit on three eighty. <laughs> I've never shot it. I shouldn't, um, but I I do. <laughs> when I was, and the reason being is, is I'm gonna get, get a little bit morbid here, but um, in my senior year of college i interned with the local police department here mm-hmm. and a few months before i entered it was a narcotics unit um uh, we had an officer killed um he uh he didn't have kevlar on um he was an old school guy he was like months away from retiring you know Jeez. and he was a midnight guy and just really well respected in the department and very you know 500 officer department decent size uh department and um, he took three rounds of the chest of 380 and it killed him. I mean, he had no chance. So, Jesus. um, yeah, it was awful. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was a big deal in our, t- in, in the city I live in. Um, but you know, three rounds of, you know, three center mass hits of 380 put down like a six foot five, 200 some odd pound dude. Um, yeah. 
So, you know, that's always kind of stuck with me, you know, A, you know, because I was interning and there was something I was really talked about. And then B, I'm like, man, it was 380. You know, I know a lot of people crap on it, but, you know, at the time, it's, it's, it's hot in Florida and I, I could pocket carry it. And sure, I just yeah. wanted to do something. So, I mean, I'd bounce between that and then a, a 19. So, <laughs> and, you know, it didn't honestly, depend on what I was wearing. It go, I mean, people say a lot that comfort shouldn't be the deciding factor, but I think it should at least be a factor, right? And then when you look at the smaller calibers like 380 and 9 millimeter versus the guys that are like, okay, 45 or bust, um, capacity, right? I would rather take my um, <clears throat> my shield with seven rounds of, or even with the extension, eight rounds of 9 millimeter versus the five rounds of 45 i'd rather have the nine millimeter as you know looking at modern ballistics and everything and um or even your experience right uh seeing what you what you had dealt with and in, in, in that instance um i think context is is important when people look at that right you know and you're comfortable with what you're comfortable with so i mean ultimately it's your decision right like you want to carry 45 hey <laughs> have at it man and i have i have a couple friends that swear by it and they're like, yeah, no, this is amazing. I love it. Unfortunately, he carries it in a Spring, uh, Springfield XD. What are you going to do? <clears throat> um, and the other carry gun he bought, that uh, he was going to replace it, and um, he opted for a Kimber Micro 9. I was like, dude, that's not that's not better. Like, you're supposed, to, you're supposed to be upgrading. And his wife wound up taking the Micro 9 because she liked it so much. I'm like, okay. all right, so here we are, back to square one, except that now both of you have crappy, unreliable guns instead of just one of you. So yeah. next time, just listen to me and go buy a Glock <laughs> or a SIG. Yeah, I mean, you know. you know, I, I wanted to upgrade, and I was like, all right, it's time to carry something bigger. And I went with a 43X. I, my buddy had a 43, shot it, and I was like, eh, I, I didn't like the 43. Uh, I didn't shoot it that well. I, I didn't like the way it fit. And I was like, and I don't have big hands. I just didn't like the gun that much. Yeah. And then I shot a 48. And I was like, okay, I dig the 48. But I didn't want the extra barrel length. Exactly. I didn't like the way it looked. Um, I'm like, when I, I, I don't at need it, that length. Yeah, when I looked at it, I was like, <clears throat> you know, looking at it, looking at it. I go, okay, I kind of, I mean, I want it, like, same thing, I want something a little bit bigger, right? And I, um, I held it up. I compared it next to a 19 and it's like dimensions are exactly the same. You're just saving. What is it like three eighths of an inch of width or something? It, it just, it seems stupid to me. You know, like I have a Glock 19 at home. If I, if I'm going to buy this 48, I might as well just go carry the 19 that already has like the red dot and everything done to it. So I went with the 43 X and honestly, I, I mean, I've had a, a great experience with it. I, I love the ergonomics. I love the grip. Um, <clears throat> the S15 magazines coming out were the deciding factor for me. I was like, yep, that's it. I'm getting it. There's no cool. doubt in my mind. Up until that so point, like it was now, the... I'm... Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, um, I'm, I'm, tra- I'm going to transition to something. No, up until that point, it was uh, I, I was on the fence between the 365 and, and the Glock. I just didn't... Um, I'm not big on thumb safeties. Um, because most guns have the trigger safety, but, uh, the 365, not even having the trigger safety. Um, I was like, eh, you know, mm, I don't know if I love that. So it was either, you know, the 365, the thumb safety or the Glock with the trigger safety. I'm like, you know, I'll just go Glock. You trust it. Parts are cheap. Um, they're like the, you know, they're like the Toyota Camry of handguns. They never break and they're reliable. That is the exact, that is the exact description I give. Of yep. a Glock, like a 19, like the 19 for me is the midsize sedan. It is the Toyota Camry, and like the 43X is the Corolla. Um, right. <laughs> it, it it really is like Glocks or Toyotas to me. Um, but I've been recently lusting the Staccatos. I'm like, um, I really, really want one of these because I love 1911. Right. Um, because I actually did carry for a little bit, and I ended up selling it to someone. Uh, it was a good gun. It was a Springfield champion operator, the 1911, which okay. I, I, I'm not a fan of Springfield polymer guns, but their 1911s are actually really nice. I've um, heard Vickers actually about talked them. about that. Yeah. Like my TRP 
you know, it's a Springfield TRP. That's probably the best bang for your buck you can get before you start getting into super high end 1911s, you know, being a factory rolled out gun. Um, the fit and finish is incredible. I mean, it's a tight gun. Like I love my TRP. It's, it's, it feels like a slide frame feels like it's on ball, ball bearings. It's really, really good. Um, but for a while I was like, let me try to, I was like, I'm going to FUD this up. And I'm like, I want to carry a 1911. And I, I bought a champion operator, um, which was full size grip with a shorter slide, like an officer slide and, and had yeah. a rail on it. Um, it was aluminum body or frame and steel slide. Um, it let you know it was being shot. Like that gun <laughs> definitely had some recoil oh to it. Like it yeah. had, it almost had like 40 snap to it. It felt like. See, um, I, that's, I hate that about shooting 40. Honestly, I'd rather just jump up to 45 at that point. Um, yep. But I mean, and I, I don't know if I would go with a staccato. Honestly, I, but I have the same feeling. I've been really looking at a, um, a Tri 11 from Triarch. Um, oh yeah. But, I mean, any of them. I mean, like, you can just you watch the videos, and you can watch guys work in the actions on these things, and just like you said, it just you can just feel how smooth it is and, like, the craftsmanship. And then if you look at, you know, the weight of the gun versus the low recoil of 9mm, I'm like, this thing has mm-hmm. to be, like, stupid easy to shoot well. That <laughs> It has to be. 1911 triggers are awesome. You got all that weight of the gun helping fight the recoil. Like, it has to be a super fun gun to shoot. Mm-hmm. And have you seen what is it, Monsoon Tactical has been doing, even highlighting, I forgot which company is doing it, but the, the chunk port that they're doing on the staccatos. No, I haven't seen that. They're doing, they're doing check it out when you're when we're done or, or whenever you can. Um, it's called the chunk port. And what they're doing is they're going on the top of the slide and into the barrel. So they're, they're taking off the front sight, putting a big chunk of a port. It's like one big port. <laughs> and remilling and putting the slide behind it, and it looks awesome. It's flat shooting. It's like, like I think it's gonna cost you like four hundred and fifty bucks with multicolor Cerakote, or like three fifty or three seventy five for just a single color Cerakote on on the staccatos. They're doing it on the P's and the C's. It's pretty cool, man. But it's all over Monsoon Tactical's Instagram. See, and I, I just I feel like with something like that, I'd be afraid to carry it. You know, it's like. I don't want anything bad to happen to it. I love this gun more than life itself. Right. <laughs> right. Like I, I came like super, super close. I actually, I went, I had two guns to trade in that I wasn't using. And this was like kind of, was that, was it right before COVID? It was before COVID, but during the, the, uh, the fun rallies, we'll call them the, 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 oh. the riot. Yeah. So that's when gun shops got that initial really busy bust and they had a C. So I was going to go single stack, nine millimeter. And they had one there and I literally went there to go trade in some guns. And I know the guy's there. I know the manager there. And I was like, yeah, he's like, oh, I don't have time to do your trade right now. I was like, what? Okay. Then I'm not buying anything. Like it was just like completely dismissed me. Like I was, I'm like, they, they hooked me up with, with, with deals and you know, I get some pretty good treatment from those guys. So I used to work there. And he was like very much like didn't want to be bothered by me because he was so busy. And then I was like, all right, man, well, whatever. And I ended up, that's when I ended up getting the, uh, the 43 X instead. I was, you know, what? I'll keep my guns and the money I was going to spend on, you know, for the balance of the, of the staccato C I'll, I'll, I can just, I can buy a, uh, a 43 X. So I ended up going with the 43 X and didn't end up getting the staccato. Um, and now they're really hard to find, but, um, I, I still I see them on Instagram. I'm like, do I do a C? Do I do a C two? I'm like, but that's a lot of gun. Like I I held the grip of like the C two, and I've got small hands. It's just it's it's thick, and I'm like <laughs> I don't know how this would work like every day for a yeah. carry gun. See, I and I'd be going down to eight rounds. I don't even know how that would. I, I can't imagine that being comfortable to conceal carry, right? I mean, like I look at the 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 staccatos or the tri elevens and stuff, and I'm like. Every time I imagine carrying one, I just imagine it on like a duty belt, <laughs> you know, like some kind of outside yeah. the waistband. And <clears throat> I know I've seen pictures. I know people carry them like in an appendix rig or something. I'm like, man, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how I would make that happen. It just it seems so uncomfortable, you know, with all that weight. 
it's like uh, carrying a boat anchor around in your pants. Yeah, I and, know and there's uh, there's guys that that like carrying the 1911 platform, and that's all they'll ever right. That's all they'll ever carry, um, mm-hmm. for better or for worse, right? Uh, my co-host Sam that I do the show with, uh, he he tried it, and he's a tiny dude, right? He's like five four, and was maybe like, I mean. 160 pounds and he was carrying a full size 1911 and 45 uh like and not even the good like i remember when he came over the one time like he didn't have a good belt on he had like a kind of a crappy holster and this thing would look like he was just pulling his pants down like man i can oh, never see man. myself doing that you know but i yeah i do really want one <laughs> I, I do really want one i have like a crappy rock island uh 1911 um, still a ton of fun to shoot. Probably the the shittiest yeah. sights in the world, but uh, you know, a ton of fun to shoot anyway. But um, hey, man, mm-hmm. listen, I, I really appreciate. Yeah, I mean, like, okay, uh, uh, yeah. And uh, we're we we're gonna have to do this again soon. Um, you got a ton of knowledge, uh, stuff that I have no Thanks. idea about. Um, I know we we battled through some issues today with the uh, the connectivity and all that, but. Uh, uh, hopefully here in, a, in another couple of weeks or something, we can uh, we can touch base again and and uh, give it another go. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely it's going to be my passion and it's something I really enjoy. There's a lot of different ways we can we can go about talking about stuff, man. Because I mean, it's 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 a it's a pretty diverse world out there when it comes to guns. I mean, yeah. from FUD stuff to tactical stuff, man. I mean, like I've I've kind of put my hands in a little bit of everything, and I've gotten lucky because of you know being in the industry and stuff. So got to learn a lot of stuff yeah no absolutely and uh like i said i appreciate you taking the time to come on uh it was a good discussion man and uh we'll be in touch all right all right man take it easy be safe all right take care Hey guys, thanks for checking out the episode. A big shout out again to Tim from Concept Gray. Check him out on Instagram. Uh, Great guy, uh, great photographer, very, very knowledgeable. Really appreciate him uh, taking the time to come on and speak with me, uh, share his knowledge, share his experience uh, with, with us and our audience. Uh, We're going to keep doing stuff like this, guys. I really enjoy having these conversations with people that uh, come from all walks of life with all different uh, experiences and all different kinds of knowledge. Uh, So look for more of that to come. And uh, like we always say here, get out there and train and be prepared.